looks like it's uh, 10 past 2, so me today with uh, a lot of seminars on campus, we should get started. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Matt Wheeler from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Um, but before that, he was actually an Aggie. He did his bachelor's degree in animal science on this campus. He has a master's degree from animal science on this campus, and he played on several winning football teams from this campus back in the day. We won't go back exactly which day that was. <laughs> back in the day. And from here he went to Fort Collins, the Colorado State University, to do a PhD with George Seidel, who's a National Academy member. So there's some illustrious uh, genealogy there besides Gary Anderson. Uh, he then went and did postdocs at the University of Virginia and at uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison. And in 1989 he arrived at the University of Illinois in three departments. Have you always been in three departments? No, I was first initially in animal science. So he's in the Department of Animal Science, um, Bioengineering? Bioengineering and Clinical Sciences. So he actually beats me. He only has two departments and two deans. He's got even more. So I have to commiserate with him on that, which we will probably do over a single malt tonight. Um, besides having a very interesting uh, background in animal science, Matt works in microfluidics, uh, embryo transfer, transgenic animals. There's a variety of things that he does, so he's a man of many talents. Among which, I saw him sitting in a boat that was trying to sink in Brazil, uh, talking science with Marcelo Bertolini, who was constantly bailing <laughs> and catching fish, where Matt was not catching fish, but they never quit talking reproductive biology. It was incredibly impressive to be out in the middle of a pond who, with who knows what living in it, because we were in northern Brazil, and just talking away, and, and Marcelo's bailing and catching fish, and Matt's just going on about science. So he really had, can focus when he needs to. So without any further ado, I will have Matt take this podium to talk about strategies for regenerating bone. Thanks, sir. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, UC Davis is pretty pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, I spent a lot of good time here and I have a lot of good friends here. And it's just a really honor for me to be here with you today. What I'd like to do is, is talk a little bit about um, some of the work we've been doing with my colleagues. I fortunately, uh, I've been fortunate in my career. I got to work with a bunch of really, really smart people. I'm not sure why they kept me around, but uh, I'm glad, I'm really glad that they did. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about what we've been doing um, with stem cells and animal models um, and patients. I'm going to spend a little time talking about the stem cells because everybody, whenever I give one of these talks, everybody says you don't talk enough about the stem cells. You spend way too much time on the patients. But that's what's important to me. Um, so just a little bit of background. One of the big issues in craniofacial surgery is, is delayed nonunion fractures, fractures that just will not heal regardless of what, what happens. And certainly there are a number of, of causes of these, trauma, tumor resection in oral cancer, abnormal development like cleft palates, and those are some of the, some of the syndromes you see on the side there. One of the big issues uh, in the most recent um, past and, and currently is, is critical size defects. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about, about some of these defects and how they're being um, a number of our, our, our warfighters are, are, are dealing with these and how the, the, the surgeons that, uh, that, that treat these patients. Um, there are about half a million of these procedures an annually. Uh, autographs are the um, major um, uh, treatment. Um, but unfortunately, there's not a bone store. There's not a place in your body where you can get a big piece of bone and heal a large defect. And I'm talking about a whole mandible, a calvarium, uh, there's, just not, there's just not a donor site for that. And so even if there is a place where you can get a piece of bone that's big enough, uh, the morbidity at the donor site is, 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 is severe. Allografts, the, the associated problems we've known about for years, immune rejection, disease transmission. And one of the, the, the real improvements in this area is, was metallic implants, titanium and, and stainless steel. But unfortunately, bone is one of those tissues that either use it or lose it. And so stress shielding is a phenomenon that we see that, that the, the plate or the screws uh, take all the, take all the, uh, the stress 
and then the bone fails, typically at the interface of either the glue or, or, or the, uh, how it's fixed to the bone. So bone tissue engineering is one area that has, has starting to really, uh, receive a lot of attention. There's a number of papers in the literature, um, primarily with, with laboratory animals, um, um, mice and rats, some rabbit work. Um, this is a, an alternative to some of those, those uh, in vivo therapies, if you will, uh, allografts and, and autographs. Um, and one of the ideas, and, and we think about it as a three-legged stool where there's cells, there's scaffolds, and there's some kind of signal that, that causes regeneration. And so these are just some of the, the um, materials, cells, and, and um, growth factors that have been used over the years. And I'll talk a little bit more about those as we go along. We've been, I initially, when I went to Illinois, was interested in embryonic stem cells, and we actually produced embryonic stem cells from swine in the early 90s, and I was fortunate enough to be in that group at, at Madison along with Jamie Thompson that was interested in, in genetic engineering of, of um, animals, but also stem cells, and, and how to, how to um, uh, transfer genes into, into, into larger animals. And so, um, mesenchymal stem cells came to me later. Uh, I had a graduate student that was interested in, in adult stem cells, and, and she and I began to talk, and she did some preliminary studies, and we got interested in, in, in mesenchymal stem cells. And, and certainly there are a number of, of benefits. I mean, they're reasonably easy to isolate. Uh, they have a property where they stick to plastic or polystyrene adherence. And, but unfortunately, they're heterogene heterogeneous populations and, and you know, need some characterization. Um, physiologically, um, some people believe that they're pericytes that um, associate with the capillary network. Uh, they've been shown to be angiogenic, anti-apoptotic, and anti-inflammatory, so they might be a good, good choice for regenerative biology. Um, one of the other uh, very useful properties is expansion. We can, we can grow them in vitro, uh, and we can expand them a billion fold, so we can get a lot, enough cells to do a lot of different therapies. Um, and, and I think probably the most unique uh, aspect is their ability to differentiate into essentially a large variety of, of tissues involved in, in musculoskeletal and, and connective tissue. So bone, cartilage, fat, um, muscle, uh, other connective tissue, and, and even in the right um, uh, circumstances into neural tissue. So we, uh, when we started down this road, Certainly, if you're going to go to translational um, therapies, you need to have a cell source that is, is robust, that's easy to harvest, and um, is le as least invasive on the patient as, you as, as it can possibly be. And so the two uh, cell types um, that we focused on were bone marrow stem cells and, and adipose-derived stem cells. And bone marrow uh, has been the gold standard. People forget that we've been doing bone marrow transfers for more than 40 years. There's a lot of, lot of data, a lot of safety, uh, a lot of, of, of expertise in that area. But one of the, lim the limitations is extraction. The biopsy is painful. Um, you, you can't get a large number of cells from, from a donor. Um, and the, the um, incidence of stem cells in the marrow is about one cell per, per 10,000 cells. Okay, so with that few cells, typically you have to expand them in vitro. With adipose-derived stem cells, you know, typically uh, one of the limitations is they have been not studied as well. Um, they have been shown to uh, uh, differentiate into bone, which is something we're interested in. One of the strengths is the extraction procedure. You can use liposuction, and they're about a little over um, 250,000 liposuction procedures a year done in the United States. Uh, you can get a lot more cells, so they're about tenfold higher in fat. And expansion is not, is not necessarily required. You can actually isolate cells in the OR and put them back into patients. And so this is a photograph of a, phys a physician that is doing liposuction on himself to isolate fat. I would not uh, suggest you do that at home, but uh, certainly it, it goes to the notion that it's, it's, a, it's a procedure that's not terribly painful. And so... Um, uh, maybe it may be an alternative. So we asked one simple question initially, and that was, are they equivalent um, essentially for, for tissue engineering? And so to do that, 
We isolated stem cells from fat and from bone marrow, and these are some photographs of the early isolations and then, then the culture. And if you look at the cells um, in culture, undifferentiated, they're essentially identical. So that was the first step. The next thing we did was we took the cells and differentiated them in vitro. And if you look in your, your upper left-hand corner, there's with no staining, that box is the undifferentiated cells. And then the, the three different uh, assays we did, alkaline phosphatase staining, alzerian red S staining, and van Casa staining, to basically look for cartilage for alkaline phosphatase, but for bone formation in, in the other two. And as you come down the slide, you'll see uh, as you get to about day seven, there starts to be these red nodules that form. And this is, these are um, cells that have differentiated toward bone and are starting to accumulate calcium. And as you get down to day 28, you can see significant amount of bone formation in vitro. I mean, literally gram quantities of bone in vitro in as little as four weeks. Um, to assay these, you actually have to scrape them off the dish. I mean, it's, it's calcified bone and it, it shows all the, the markers that you would expect. So, and, and I know he's not here with us now, but, but Harris Lewin was uh, uh, the director of the institute where I worked, the Institute for Genomic Biology, and one of, the, one of the focuses of that is to look at the genomics and transcriptomics of, of cells, and so this is a, the initial study that we did with one of Harris's gene chips, and this, this chip looks at about 13 and a half thousand uh, porcine genes, and you can see uh, adipose, or, uh, adipose derived stem cells differentiate toward adipose, toward uh, bone marrow, toward adipose, uh, adipose toward bone, and, and bone toward bone. Um, there is some difference in expression. And if you look at the two panels on your, on your right, you see during differentiation uh, at time zero for the bone marrow derived stem cells versus the adipose derived stem cells. As you go through differentiation, you get more genes being expressed. And so we've looked at some of those. The panels here in the bottom uh, um, make that same point, um, that as you, as you differentiate the cells, we get more, uh, we get a specific expression of, of bone uh, associated genes. And so just to give you a little bit of a flavor, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but looking at adipose derived stem cells or bone marrow derived stem cells, and you look at categories of genes being expressed. You know, what you, genes that you'd ex expect, skeletal muscle system development, tissue development, cell movement, cell trafficking. One of the interesting things about these uh, mesenchymal stem cells is they respond to many of the same um, cues as immune cells during, a, during an injury or a, a cut or trauma. And so, you know, we like to think of them as the second responders, the as immune cells being the first responders, but these also respond to many of those inflammatory cytokines. And so you can just see uh, some of the genes that are, that are involved in this, and, and it, it's as you would expect if um, these cells were involved in, in regeneration. So um, this is a slide that I, I knew I was coming to Davis, and I asked my postdoc, Massimo Biona from Italy, I said, I want some new data. And he goes, OK, I will have new data. I promise, I promise. So on Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock, I was getting ready to leave, and he gave me 21 slides okay, of new data. So uh, I'm going to show you a few of them. I didn't bring them all. But um, what this shows is basically when you, when you go toward, and if we start in this, this panel here, for adipogenesis, as those cells uh, differentiate toward bone, um, they, they, um, the cells don't proliferate. They actually increase in size. And as, they, as the cells, if you're going to push them toward, toward osteogenic differentiation, they actually will, will proliferate. So he's got a couple of movies, and what, what he wants to, well, that's, those are not going to play, are they? Well, shoot. Anyways, what he wanted to show you is that these cells actually uh, grow in size. They actually accumulate lipid or cytoskeleton, and the cells that are going toward, toward bone actually proliferate and make more and more cells. So um, it's, it's interesting when you push these cells in one to one differentiation paradigm or another, you can actually get them to do quite different things. So there's no talk that's, that's worthwhile that doesn't have a model, and this is our, our current model of gene expression and, and with adipose or bone marrow derived stem cells, some of the genes that are being expressed, some of the uh, physiology that's happening, um, 
including collagen formation, immune suppression, angiogenesis, all the things you'd expect when bone is, uh, or tissue is regenerating. Migration, and we'll talk a little bit about migration in a minute. Um, and the genes that are being expressed as you go from adipose to bone or from bone um, to, uh, to bone. And so there's a lot of, a lot of uh, parts in here we still need to fill in, but we're starting to get a more clear picture of how these, these genes are, are, are involved in, in regeneration. So this is the part of the talk um, where I want to talk about how we use these cells and, and why this area of study and areas like this are important. And I apologize in advance. I get a little emotional about this because this is, is uh, I think, is something that's important to all of us. So one of the issues about sending young men and women to war is that they come into harm's way. And we've been very good over the years at protecting them with new, new widgets and gizmos and battle armor and Kevlar and different things. Unfortunately, uh, places where we're, we, we send young men and women um, are not conducive to complete body armor, and so their face is exposed. And as, as an old scientist told me, an old craniofacial surgeon told me, your face is your front porch. So if you look at the battle statistics over the last um, number of years, and these statistics are from up to 2009, there were some 31,000 casualties in Iraq and Afghanistan. And if you look at the orange text there, uh, essentially all the traumatic brain injuries has, have some form of accompanying craniofacial or maxiofacial trauma. And so this amounts to about 26% of those 31,000 injuries, and you can do the mathematics on that. So this is a soldier that was shot in the face. Bullet entered through his lips, exited through his ear in the, in the upper right panel. And in, the, in the, the travel of that bullet, it basically uh, did a, a, a perioral soft tissue avulsion, basically destroyed his lips, uh, la severely lacerated his tongue. The hard tissue fractures, if you look at the, the uh, craniofacial CT on the bottom, you can see the, the right hemimandible is completely obliterated. How do you fix that? If we're going to send him there, it's our responsibility to fix that. So this is, a, this is an individual that had the best medical care that we can offer. Um, this is a mo stereolith model, and essentially all these, these patients have models made of their, of their bone injuries. And um, these, are, these are expensive. These are three or $4,000 a piece. But the surgeons make these so they can bend the plates and customize the hardware to repair this injury. And so you can see that there's quite um, a lot of uh, effort invested in this. Um, but again, it's titanium or stainless steel, and the problem is stress shielding. So how do you, how do you repair a severe mandible injury without using a lot of metal? So we've thought a lot about that. And this is, this is the prognosis for this patient, all right? This is after 60 surgeries, all right? Okay, and, and, and if somebody will ask me where he is, I will tell you where he is. He's back on patrol in Iraq. Because when he comes home, he's a monster. In Iraq, he's a hero. So my and my colleagues' point of view is, if we're going to send him, we need to fix him. All right, so how does my animal science training come in? You know, one of the, the, the great things about having training from Davis is they train you to do many, many things. So we've used the pig as a model for craniofacial uh, regeneration. Um, nice thing about the pig is it's a lot of, there's a lot of bone. Um, there's a lot of, of uh, intricate surgery you can do. There's a lot of reagents. There's antibodies. There's, there's a lot of, of materials that will help um, in, 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 in studying some of these, these, um, these syndromes or these, these, these uh, traumas. Um, the other th nice thing about a pig is it's a pig, and pigs never miss a meal. So even if you do severe uh, mandibular reconstruction on pigs, they, we have not had one to date miss a meal the next morning. So as I, some of my family and, and friends are in the audience here, and 
they will tell you I'm not always the most patient person. And so once we had some idea that these cells were going to make bone, I said to the students, I want to, I want to go into the animals and I want to see if we, can, if we can heal a defect. I don't care how big the defect is yet, but I want to see if it will work. So I had a graduate student who's, I'll talk to you about one of her, one of her uh, she was, a, she was a, a sergeant that was deployed in, in Iraq, uh, spent two tours there, and one of her, one of her platoon mates uh, is one of the patients I'll show you in a moment, but she was highly motivated because this was for, for her people. So we, uh, the model we developed was we went into the pig mandible, and if you look at the box here on the right, we, this is, a, this is a, a harvested section from a sacrificed animal. We drilled a 10 millimeter hole in the, in the mandible after we harvested it, just as a, as a reference, so people could see the size of the hole. Two weeks before, we drilled a similar size hole in this part of the mandible and treated it with stem cells, either intravenously or direct injection into the mandible. And then the panel on the right is the control. So we drilled the hole, we didn't treat it with stem cells. All right. So, as I told you, I worked with a lot of really smart people, but to me, this is not too hard to interpret. There's a hole or there's not a hole, okay? And so we were very encouraged, and we did 15 more animals to prove to ourselves that this would work. Well, you look at that, and any good bone biologist will say, well, how do we know that that's not soft tissue or scarring or whatever? Well, that's a great question. And so, again, here's a, here's a, a higher magnification of that. But we, we took the sections out, and those of you that do histology and soft tissues, um, you won't appreciate a bone biologist until you try to section a piece of bone um, in plastic. Okay, and so this is a CT scan of that section that I just showed you. The blue column is actually where we removed the, where we drilled the defect, made the defect, and that's actually um, uh, spongy bone forming in. So it's actually bone. Okay, you can see it on the CT, on the micro CT scan. The histology on your right is actually uh, Sanderson's uh, bone stain with acid fusion. And anything that's purple is bone, and you can see the native bone on the top. Anything that's blue is osteoid or, or cells that are, that are uh, uh, differentiating or developing. So you can see that that, what, that, that filler in that hole is actually, is actually bone. And then when you do the CT uh, series, you can see that, that in the control, even at four weeks, it's not completely healed, but you get out to um, four weeks in, in essentially all the treatments. We did two different animal, two different donors, two different cell injection, either direct injection into the, into the defect, which I thought was going to be a great control. You squirt it in there, the cells go away, and it's not going to heal. Turns out it heals just as well as, as injecting it into the, into the ear vein and having it migrate to the site of injury. And so that's, that would be a great opportunity for surgeons to deliver the stem cells. So we had some great initial um, information that, that this was going to be a, a viable alternative. Well, I talked a little bit about critical size defects in the beginning. We didn't know what the critical size defect in the pig was, so we actually had to do another study where we established that a 25 millimeter defect in the mandible of pig was actually critical size. And a critical size defect is a defect that will not heal spontaneously on its own. You have to do something with it. We knew 6 millimeters, 10 millimeters, 16 millimeters would but 25 millimeter defects will not heal. So it gave us a, a place to start. So again, here's a 25 millimeter defect in a pig mandible, and you can see it's a pretty big piece of bone out of there. Um, but the pig has a lot of bone, and as I said, even these animals never, never missed a meal. So we did a couple of different things. We've used a lot of different materials, and I don't know how many material scientists are out there, but I am material scientists, as you, if you get to know them, they have one or two favorite materials that they study and they, they do a lot of mar marvelous things with it. I'm, I'm not a material scientist, so I'm not, I'm not married to any one material, so we've used a variety of different materials. We've used ceramics uh, that you can directly deposit and make in a variety of different configurations. We've used, we've used hydrogels, which are like gelatin or jello that you can suspend the cells in. Um, we're look, we were, I was looking for a space filling uh, scaffold that would bring the cells there and we actually uh, have developed some of those but to make a long story short this is a critical size defect, a 25 millimeter defect at 8 weeks this will never heal this is one of our defects at, 25, or at 8 weeks with scaffold and stem cells and it's completely healed, it's not remodeled yet, it's not perfect but it's completely 
completely filled in, and the structural integrity of that bone in the middle is just the same as the surrounding bone. So uh, the stem cell biologists out there go, well, he really hasn't told us anything about how, how he's characterized the cells and what markers he's looked at. And as, as you stem cell biologists know, there are many, many markers you could characterize. And fortunately at Illinois, we have, we have a swine group that's interested in, in cell service markers. And so we have a, we have a, um, a variety of them to use. We've, we focused initially on CD34 um, um, protein on the surface of cells. Uh, we separated, we collected the cells, we separated them fresh into CD34, CD34 positive and negative, and then we mixed them back in equal compositions. Um, and then we again went in and made these 25 millimeter, 10 or 25 millimeter defects and added a variety of different um, cell numbers because again we're trying to figure out what's the optimal treatment for a patient with, a, with, a, with the optimal scaffold and the optimal cell number. And <clears throat> One of the things that we saw, and, I, and it's, this has been reported in literature before, that with fresh cells, if you separate the cells out, you still get some effect, either, both in the, the positive and negative cells, but you get a much greater effect in the freshly isolated cells that are, is a heterogeneous population. Again, we don't necessarily know why that is yet, but we do know that, that um, either mixing them together, separating them is not, the best, is not the best thing for the cells, and we get a much better healing. Um, if you don't do that. So again, there's our 25 millimeter defect. Uh, we used uh, um, DEXA to look at bone mineral density, uh, dual X-ray absorptiometry. And you can see in the upper panel that that circle at the top is the piece of bone we removed. And then there's the DEXA scan of the healed bone. And then the one below it is the non-healed bone. And you can see that the cultured cells, the separated cells, the cells that work the best in, in, in translation back to the animal are the freshly isolated, um, adhered um, adipose-derived stem cells. So that's the model that we have, have decided to, to go with. So this is a, the patient that I'm going to show you next. He was a previously healthy 25-year-old male. He was in the Illinois National Guard in the 15th 44th Transportation Battalion. He was deployed to Iraq, and on the first push to Baghdad, his Humvee was hit by a roadside bomb. He was thrown clear of his Humvee, landed on his back. His body armor protected him. Uh, he had a little scratch underneath his nose until the door of the Humvee that went 100 feet straight up in the air came down and landed on edge on the bridge of his nose. He sustained severe craniofacial injuries. He was um, treated in Baghdad, transferred to Fort Knox, Kentucky, and referred to my colleague in Champaign. And this is what he looked like when he came. And he, he kind of looks like an old man. His maxilla was completely pulverized. So his upper jaw is gone. He looks like an old man without his dentures. Okay, So this is how he came. This is the CT scan. And you can see there's nothing to pin, plate, or screw because there's just nothing there. These are the two molars uh, on the upper jaw. His hard palate is gone. The bridge of his nose is gone. It's just go and, and all the soft tissue in the hard palate was also gone. So whenever he would eat something, it would go up into his sinuses. So he had to drink soup. So he was in, a, he was in pretty bad shape. So um, my colleague, Michael Goldwasser, uh, who's the craniofacial surgeon at, at our local hospital, made this model. And he actually, this, is, this model has served as our inspiration. Um, and the white piece is the piece of bone that we needed to fabricate to, to help this individual. And unfortunately, the, some of the tools that I'm going to talk to you about uh, that we have in our repertoire now, we didn't have when this patient was um, being treated. So they went into the, into the tubercoxi of the hip removed bone, and then actually these are some titanium plates and screws to rebuild his maxilla. They took a little piece of his lip and made an excision and actually turned that to, to cover the, the hard palate um, so that there was soft tissue there so he could, so he could actually uh, suck through a straw. This is the prosthesis that after so the bone, bone healing on the left, uh, the studs for the, for the dental implants, and then the prosthesis that was fabricated for him. And then 
This is the day before Thanksgiving 2006. He was injured in August of 2003. He drank soup through a straw in the back of his throat for three years. All he wanted was a hot dog. Okay, so what I just showed you is along the top of uh, the CT scan and the conventional therapy. My colleagues and I at the Institute of Genomic Biology did not believe that that was, an, that, that that was sufficient treatment. So we developed an alternative strategy, which is to start uh, from the CT scan to make the model, to use that model to design the scaffold that we'd use basically for that patient. And so, you, so this part of it sounded really easy, but we had to have our mathematicians in the math department help us develop these algorithms to go into the, the program to make a 3D uh, <clears throat> design so we can design it we can prototype it in plastic. We can fabricate it in, in biodegradable uh, material. We can implant it. We can either load it or inject stem cells, and, and hopefully we can get the bone healed in 8 to 12 weeks. So that strategy takes 3 to 6 months as opposed to 3 years. So, so while we're sitting in, in the lab meeting, uh, we ha we've had some consults by several uh, military surgeons. We said, what do you guys think about this? He goes, well, it's not, so, it's not fast enough. I said, okay, we'll do it faster. So now the students, that comes off the CT scanner in, 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 uh, in theater, basically gets delivered to one of our computers, goes through this part, and we can get to here in 72 hours. So it's not a matter of doing it well, it's doing it well and fast. And 72 hours is a magic number because that's the time it takes somebody that's injured in Baghdad to get to Dover Air Force Base in New Hampshire. So, so when, they're, when they come off the plane, the surgeons are ready, and we can take a, we, can, we, haven't, we haven't done the fat cells yet, um, but we can take a, take a bone marrow aspirate and we can, we can begin this therapy. Uh, I ask one of, the, one of the colonels in the Army, you know, if I need a, a fat sample, how fast can I get it? And he looks at me and <clears throat> reaches his pocket, makes a phone call, and he says, Six and a half hours by F-16. So I can get it in time that I can start working with it before the patient gets here. So that's the model. We haven't fully deployed the whole, the whole scenario yet, but we're, we're in the process of getting to the point where we can do that. We're getting close. So here's the, here's the, the um, scaffold that we produce. Now one of, the, one of the challenges of working with a pig is a human that has a broken jaw, you can say, okay, we're gonna wire your jaw up, we're going to drink soup or you're going to eat jello and don't bang it against the wall, you know, for eight to ten weeks. I can't do that with a pig. So what we had to do is we had to develop what we call an internal external fixator to fix both ends of the bone so we can put the scaffold in. So we've had to modify our strategy, but we think it's a robust strategy because if we can do this in a pig, a, a, a cooperative human patient, it should, be, it should be no problem. And we're looking at similar kinds of strategies for long bone um, uh, replacement or regeneration. So this is the first, the first real iteration of uh, the scaffold. And again, pig mandible. This is a, um, it doesn't say here, this is about a, a four uh, centimeter defect, so it's much larger than the defect that I showed you. We've kind of adapted the Lego concept where you can produce inserts that you can load with stem cells or different growth factors or different combinations. Into the, into the sleeve after the sleeve's been plan, uh, implanted. And then that, that figure just shows you the stress is actually uh, displaced over the whole scaffold. So it's, it's, it's strong. Uh, we'd like to use some transgenic technology to make some spider proteins to make it even stronger and more, and, and easily, more easily biodegradable, but it, it works pretty well now. So this is just a, this is the last gory picture, I promise. Um, this is one of those defects in the mandible. So this is a scalpel handle here. This is one of the scaffolds. The scaffolds we put in, it's been loaded with stem cells. You can see the inserts here. We did away with all the metal. There is no metal anymore. Uh, these are all biodegradable rivets and washers that we developed out of the same material. So once it's put in, nothing ever has to come out. Bone invades the, the rivets and you can heat, heat either ultrasound or heat seal them in place. And so once the patient is closed up, you never have to go back and and, um, 
and modify it. And I, I don't think my movies are going to work, so um, I'm just going to pass, pass this. So here's one of those scaffolds. This is the insert there. This is the piece of bone that we removed from the, um, uh, from the mandible to replace. You can see it in place there. And then this is the control. So we basically make a similar size defect and put a plate across it to stabilize it so the pig can eat and, and there's a welfare issue. So these are uh, just some of the scans of the pig. And unfortunately, my movie won't work. But this is six weeks after surgery. You can see the defect. This is with stem cells. This is all new bone. This is, this is uh, the undisturbed uh, control. When you add a scaffold, you even improve that even more. You can see where we cut here, but the bone is, is remodeling. It's not completely healed yet, but as little as six, week, we, six weeks, we can stabilize that and get things moving uh, forward. And here's just a couple more. Again, with stem cells, you can see if there's still, a, there's still a, a defect there, but it's starting to regenerate. And again, this is one with the scaffold, and you can see the bone regeneration. So it's, it, <clears throat> we believe it works. Fortunately, in the last couple of weeks, we uh, received some uh, NIH funding to, to do 33 more pigs, and we hope that those are the last 33 pigs that we'll have to do before they can start a human clinical trial. So we're excited about that. I did bring movies to show you that pigs eat just like normal pigs. Um, these are a couple of the individuals. This is a... 400-pound gilt, 13 months post-surgery. It's a 550-pound sow, also 13 months post-surgery. So they uh, um, are about 19 months now. Uh, they show no ill effects. Um, the alignment of the jaw is not absolutely perfect, uh, but it's pretty close. If you look in the upper panel, you can actually see the red boxes and that white area in there is actually bone infiltrating the scaffold and... and um, and healing the defect. So we've, we've been pretty excited about this. So that's the first step. So if you can do it in a pig, can you do it in a human? So with some of our colleagues at the Army and uh, uh, collaborators uh, at the US Army in Texas, uh, we've used the same paradigm to develop some uh, mandible inserts and scaffolds for, um, for, for humans. <coughs> this is another pig uh, project and one of the the issues in craniofacial surgery is uh, temporomandibular joint disease, so the joint where your jaw articulates in your skull. And so this is what the normal joint looks like in a pig. Uh, Scott Hollister, my colleague at the University of Michigan, uh, basically developed a model and a scaffold. So this, the blue uh, TMJ, te te temporomandibular joint, is an intact one. What we did is we went in and actually where the yellow line is there, we, we uh, took a surgical saw and sawed off the head of the TMJ. And then that green is all bone formation. And so under the yellow line is native bone. Above the yellow line is where bone is filling into that scaffold. So that's all new bone that has been produced from this therapy. Um, the next project that we, the other, uh, an additional project we've been working on and again, we just got some funding to do this, was a spinal fusion model. Again, for spinal fusion, you have to have a bone source, either, either endogenous or, or a cadaver bone. Um, and we can make the same, uh, use the same material, polycaprolactone, which we can fabricate uh, into a variety of different uh, configurations. And these are just some of the cages that Scott's developed. And you can actually insert that in between two vertebrae after you remove the spinal disc and, and then uh, put screws in, or in our case, we're going to put our biodegradable uh, pins in. And then basically that spine is, is, is solid when the patient comes off of the surgery table and the bone will grow in there um, through normal, normal healing. So you can do a lot of different things. You know, once you, you have a paradigm that, that you're comfortable with, um, <clears throat> this is... Uh, a study, one of Massimo's, one of the new data slides that's hot off the presses. And so what Massimo's been doing is he's been taking pieces of these scaffolds and actually growing cells in culture and then placing um, a piece of the scaffold that we've been using in the, in the animal uh, into the plate, adding growth factors, and then looking for migration. So the cells actually migrate from the plated cells, migrate into the scaffolds, 
and then he's done a variety of different growth factors, BMPs, VEGF, FGF, and some combinations. And um, unfortunately, these videos probably won't work either. But what they would show you is that the cells initially plate, and then we can actually, um, using a video micrograph system, we can actually watch them migrate into the scaffold. And we used um, cells from a green fluorescent protein pig that we got from the University of Missouri. So the cells fluoresce bright green, and you can see the scaffold in black of the various treatments. And you can see the green portions of that where the cells have actually migrated into the scaffold and are starting to differentiate. So we know that we can use growth factors to encourage uh, these cells to come into these scaffolds and, and start to develop new bone. And that's just a uh, higher micrograph, one of those scaffolds with, with stem cells in it. So the last thing I want to talk to you about a little bit is, is looking at um, myogenic differentiation, differentiation in a muscle uh, using these cells. And we actually did, used a co-culture system with our green fluorescent protein cells and mouse C2C12 cells, which are our mouse uh, pericytes. Um, um, and if you culture the cells together, you actually can see up in, in panel A, there's some of our, our fluorescent cells growing with uh, some of the, the C2C12 um, non-fluorescent cells. The cells will differentiate into myotubes, and the cells will fuse. And you can see here's a, a myotube that is a, pro um, a product of the C2C12 on our ADSCs. You can actually see individual ADSCs there. But I think the one that's really interesting is that panel D where you see the, the orange cell, and that's, that's a fluorescent myotube that is a combination of the mouse cells and the pig cells. And in panel E here, this red nucleus is actually stained with a porcine-specific uh, marker. And so that's one of those pig nuclei that's actually fused in that myotube. So we actually can use these cells, and, and we can start to think about uh, um, myoosseous or, or muscle bone uh, constructs where we could replace both the muscle and the bone. And that first patient I showed you, part of the problem is his lips. Uh, the muscle was destroyed, and now maybe we can start thinking about how we could, how we could help him. Um, this is just some um, uh, uh, cyto or, uh, or histology data where, where we looked at, um, I'm sorry, this is some gene expression data where we looked at um, a couple of different mouse um, and pig-specific muscle markers, Desmond and myogenin, and you can see that in the, in the top panel, um, the black uh, is the pig cells, the green is the C2C12 cells, and the black, or in the, and the red is the combination, and you can see we're starting to see expression of, of porcine muscle-specific genes um, and also uh, myogenin down here in the bottom. So, that, so it, is, it, is, it is actually muscle uh, being, being differentiated. <clears throat> in conclusion, uh, just a couple of thoughts. You know, certainly um, the, this concept of module engineering, you know, we think about it as, as patient-inspired, physician-desired, technology required. Uh, that's kind of our, 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 the way we think about this. Um, but this, these modular uh, technologies uh, are going to allow us to make more complicated, more complex um, scaffolds and, and, and treat uh, more complex injuries. Um, the modular uh, engineering systems allow us to adapt to many different clinical needs. I mean, we talked a little bit about uh, crushed bone, but you can think about cancer, you can think about trauma. But it allows us to, to uh, adjust the parameters so we can uh, systematically examine um, a number of different hypotheses. Um, and it also suggests that you know the scaffolds that we produce, um, the coatings that we've used, the tethering of growth factors onto the materials, and the stem cells, all of, all of those things individually and in combination, um, we believe can enhance and control bone formation. And so we're really excited about the possibility about using um, molecular biology, biomedical engineering, cell culture, animal science, and, and a variety of these, these different areas uh, 
to help these patients. This has been a huge interdisciplinary effort. I get to work with a lot of really, really smart people. And I don't know if m some of you are, uh, at least one is from the University of Illinois. If you've ever been to the University of Illinois, you know that the University of Illinois and the University of Michigan are rivals. And we don't necessarily get along really well. But you know what, this is one of those examples where it's too important not to get along. And so I've had some great collaborations with the College of Dentistry and the College of Medicine and um, Biomedical Engineering at, at Michigan, um, the College of Medicine at Illinois, the Institute for Genomic Biology, Animal Science, Mechanical and Industrial Engineering, the Beckman Institute, uh, Veterinary Medicine, the local hospital, and the, the clinicians at the hospital have just donated a tremendous amount of time uh, to this effort. And every hour they spend with me is money out of their pocket, and they have spent many, many hours with us, and we, we will always be grateful to them. A lot of different folks uh, from Illinois, from Michigan, from Wisconsin. We've been fortunate. We had a, a small stem cell program for a couple of years, but um, that's, that's gone away. But the Army has stepped up, uh, NIH has recently stepped up, and the Coulter Foundation. So we've, we've patched a lot of this together, but we think we're, we're uh, close to having something that we can get into the patients and, and actually help these individuals. I'd be happy to address any questions. Questions from the audience uh, for Dr. Weaver? <laughs> so, the material of the bioscaffold and the other biodegradable materials, is there um, complete absorption of those? Is there any? Yes. So, so, I mean, I, I've shown you the, the, the exciting stuff, the, the, the workhorse um, efforts to, to show that. Um, you know, I didn't have time in an hour, but what we've done over the last um, four years is this material is called polycaprolactone and it's a bio, biodegradable polystyrene and it is, comes in powder form and you fabricate it by heating it with a laser and so basically you shake out a layer you project the laser on it and then you blow all the powder off and you, you can build anything that you want right so what we did initially is we produced some basically discs about that size and we implanted them into pigs in the loin eye, um, the muscle um, of the pig. And the pigs are long enough that we can put 16 samples per animal. And so we did that and the last animal is to be harvested when I get home and she's 30 months out from the implants. And so um, the 24 month samples are almost completely, it's almost completely gone and infiltrated with bone. And so it'll be interesting to see six months later what, what these are. But yeah, so we, we did those studies. And it's been a great model because in developing that model, a lot of my colleagues that, that look at uh, ceramics and hydrogels and different things, we've been, able to, we've been able to use that model. And the next step for us is until we can solve the, the, the muscle and the, the vasculature issues, we're going to make... Um, a myocutaneous flap. So what we do is we would take the scaffold, load it with growth factors and stem cells, and put it in the latissimus dorsi of the pig for a month. Let them vascularize it, let it start to heal, and then what we're going to do is we're just going to we're going to make the defect in the mandible. We're going to just excise it and do microvascular surgery and put it in. So that's for January. So. Yeah, really <clears throat> Can I follow up? With how how do you? Because you've talked about the transgenic produced spider silk as a possibility. How would you incorporate that into the scaffold? Yeah. So one of the problems is when we made the, you know, the it was a it was a great idea to have an external fixator, but you have to make it so thick that it's so bulky that you can't pull the tissue over it. So we uh, got to, we made a couple of design iterations and made it thinner, but it's not it's flexible, but it's not as strong as we'd like it. So Jim and I have, a, have some colleagues that actually have produced spider silk protein in the, in the milk of transgenic goats. And spiders actually make 18 different kinds of silk. And when it's, when it's produced, it's produced as a monomer. So it's, it's, it's um, uh, synthesized in milk, and you milk the goats. And then you actually can harvest it, and you can spin it. You can, 
you can do a variety of different things with it. So what we did is we, we asked them, and, this, and I didn't realize at the time what a, what, how hard this was, but we asked them for 10 grams of 100 micron fibers, okay, which is like asking for, you know, a ton and a half of diamonds. Um, <laughs> Yeah, for free, <laughs> and, they, and they graciously provided it. And so the nice thing about the spider silk, it's biodegradable, but it's heat stable. So when we hit it with the laser, it doesn't change conformation. So we're gonna, we're gonna actually mix it in with the PCL powder and then just fabricate it that way. So we, it's like reinforced concrete is what we're trying to do, or rebar. It's rebar. It's rebar. So. I like the rebar, clever. So do we have another question? Yes. So, uh, well, two questions actually. Um, so did you do a comparison between bone marrow and adipose? And have you done also uh, autologous versus allogeneic okay. in these models? So once we had our results with regard to that, that bone marrow and fat stem cells look pretty, pretty similar, because of the, the ease of harvesting the cells, we, we went completely to, to adipose drive stem cells. And to answer the second part of your question, we, we've done both. So we started off with cultured cells. The first work I showed you was from a pool of pigs that we, we uh, used as donors. So it was um, um, from donor, donor animals. Um, the second work that I showed you is <clears throat> we've actually become quite adept at doing liposuction in pigs. Not, again, another skill that I never thought I would have leaving, graduating from the University of California, Davis. But be, be that as it may, yeah. So what we did, so the, so the strategy is with the, with the pig and with the patient is that we would bring, we bring the pig in, we, we anesthetize the pig, and then we isolate, um, we do liposuction. And then in the, in the same room, um, my two postdocs basically take that and isolate the cells. And I've got them down to about an hour and 40 minutes. I want them at an hour, but I'm not, you know, I'm not unhappy with that. And then we get to about the hour mark, the surgeons come in and make the defect. And so by the time they're ready to go, we have the cells. And then we, we either mix the cells with autologous blood or we mix them with um, uh, hydrogel and put them in the... So, so yeah, we've, we've done both. The, the goal would be to go completely autologous. Just a quick question to follow up on that. But are you using plastic adherence then in that hour to hour and 40 minutes of time? Yeah, you, don't, you, don't get, you, have to get, you have to take a lot of fat to get enough. So you are using plastic adherence when you're? Yeah. So, uh, I'd, I'd like to have three or four hours. Mm -hmm. it'd, be, it'd be much cleaner, mm -hmm. but. So a follow-up question, but if it takes six and a half hours for the F-16 to get to, <laughs> to, get to the US, awesome. How long will those cells last in that tissue before you start working with it? And well, how so can you automate it so that you can start that process in yeah. 16? Yeah, so that, so, that, so that paradigm would be, um, you know, where we would probably culture the cells for a, for a, for a day or two. So um, the preference would be if we can work out the liposuction when the patient gets there. That would be the, the, the preference. So, so we've been... We've been <clears throat> I hesitate to use the word tinkering, but we've been trying to optimize different parameters to see if we can figure out what's the best way to go. This is one more question to follow up to that, but I'm, I'm thinking about that acute inflammatory response. You're saying 72 hours is really critical, but would four or five days, six days be too long, meaning is granulation already enough at that point? Yeah. So you're thinking 72 hours, but if you did it at 24 hours, that'd be too soon? No. No, but we, we and we've thought about, you know, that when you... <clears throat> Working with the military is kind of a double-edged sword. They'd like it to be. The, they'd like you to be standing there waiting immediately, and so we're, we've tried to figure out alternatives where because some of these these things you just couldn't do in theater. You, know, you just couldn't do it. Now you could you could probably you could probably get the CTs and get the scaffolds built. Um, yeah, it's you know, I, 24 hours would be better. The sooner the the sooner the better. Actually the initial aid, they would like to, to be able to put some in to, to keep the granulation, keep the scarring down. If they can slow that, that's a huge, huge benefit. Are you worried at all about allergy reactions 
difference with the protein from a spider silk? We really haven't. We haven't thought about that. No. No. No, 10 grams isn't at the test. Mm -hmm. No. No. No, but it is something. That, it, it is something that you know. Now, I will say all the things that we have used, we we're very um, methodical about selecting them. They're all. They're already all approved. Now, the, uh, PCL is approved for bone regeneration therapy. It's just not approved in this in this configuration. So it so each one of these things is is really a device. It's a medical device. And so we have to be able to show that the the mandible scaffold and the TMJ scaffold and the spine scaffold are will will work in that configuration. They know if you you put in PCL sheets or or um, it uh, suspended hydrogels, it it works. So we we picked growth factors and things that that are already being used. We're trying to be a little more. Um, tactical about how we, we put them together. So. Do we have any other questions for Professor Weems? Wayne once, going twice. <laughs> so for those of you graduates, oh, we have a question in the back. Yes. Yeah. So um, maybe this has all been done already or whatnot. I'm interested in stem cell biology. So Can you speak up a little bit? I, I'm interested in the stem cell aspect of it. So. Um, I was wondering, does your lab, have they already established a mechanism of how this works? Not necessarily, you know, it clearly works, but what about the underlying mechanisms of how it works? So, we're, st we're starting to look at those kind of things. I mean, as, as you might imagine, and I already told you I'm not very patient, um, and I will tell you that, uh, and, and I know sometimes when I speak to stem cell audiences, you know, they want to know every, they want to know them characterized down to, um, the only question that the doctors ever ask me is, is it going to work? Military doctors in particular don't, they care, but they, they're concerned about this soldier that's in front of them. So yeah, we have, we're, we're trying to go back and fill in the holes, so I'm not trying to dodge your answer because we, as scientists we'd like to know. But as we've pushed forward the surgical side of this, you know, coming back and filling in those, some of those, those unknown questions needs to be done. Can I ask you just a quick follow-up on that? So you're happy with the adipose and uh, the bone marrow, then you probably aren't going to look at induced pluripotency or any of those other... Well, you know, as a scientist, you, you know yeah. that my interest in, in, in those. And, and, we, and we, you know, we've entertained that. Uh, I have a a new um, collaboration with the University of North Carolina with a pediatric craniofacial surgeon. I didn't know that those existed. But he called me up and he's got a cleft model that he wants to make in a pig and he wants to use stem cells from Wharton's jelly. So, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna I mean, I, I tried to, you know, we're, we're trying to use all the tools in the toolbox to solve the problem. And if it's IPS cells or, or, or bone marrow or other cells, you know, I, just like the, the, the materials, I don't believe that there's one material that'll do everything. Um, we're in the process of working with a colleague that actually makes uh, scaffolds out of hyaluronic acid, and we're gonna, we think we're going to be able to print the cells in the matrix, and we're gonna, what we want to do is print the, the, the mesenchymal stem cells and then endothelial cells, and we want to actually make a construct and then um, inject it into, we're actually looking at cartilage for that, that project and basically we've been able to show that when we do that we can actually roll the scaffold and inject it through a hypodermic needle and it'll lay back out flat. So yeah, there's a lot of, you know, that's when you're surrounded by a bunch of smart people and, and all you have to do is wrangle the pigs, it's pretty easy to. <laughs> One last question. Okay. So what's the largest scaffold that you've actually put you know what? I brought them with me, and I left them. I left them at Jim's house. So the so the largest scaffold is 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 about like that. And have you done uh, potential strength testing on it? Yes. Yeah. And it matches the same parameters. Well, I mean, not when you not when you put it in. Um, so what? But when the, you take it out. When you take it out, yes. Of weeks, right. 
it matches the right. native phone in terms of structure. So I think we'll end it there. For the graduate students of the audience, I want to point out, for a fellow who lived in the beef barn, <laughs> rode his bicycle across this space when it was a muddy field to go to class, You've heard the work that Matt's doing. He's the chairman of the Academic Senate at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, and he's the uh, Big Ten, one of the NCAA reps to the Big Ten and the NCAA from the university. So there's a great future ahead of you if you work hard and work with smart people. <laughs>